This is a Guayki Cloud 50 watt desktop CO2 laser. This is an Ohmtec Polar desktop 50 watt CO2 laser. And this is an unrelated leaf blower. I want to say right off the bat before I get into anything that if you're in the market for a small desktop CO2 laser, but don't have Glowforge money, both of these are good options and I don't think you would regret purchasing them. I wanted to say that right at the beginning because I'm going to spend most of the video complaining about these two idiots. This is the Ohmtec Polar 350 by Ohmtec. I already said that. This is the Guayki Cloud. I think. It's so ambiguous. Guayki? Guik? Guiki? Gvaika. I'm going to call it Gwyneth. Gwyneth Cloud Tro. Let's start off strong. Both of these have extremely high perceived build quality. The top, plate glass. The body and sides, fabricated sheet steel. The base, quarter inch thick aluminum plate. These are very heavy, very high build quality. You will not question the quality of these machines when you uncrate them. Mostly. With both of these, when I took them out of the crate, there was coolant on them and in them in places other than the cooling system. But aside from that, high build quality. By the way, these lids, they're friction hinges. I expect them to have hydraulic struts or something. Both of these machines come with ducting for the exhaust fan, as well as an inline booster fan, should you desire such a thing. And as far as noise level goes, these exhaust fans emit about 70 decibels. It's not super loud, but for in-house use, it is a little bit on the loud side. Liquid cooling for the laser tube is tightly integrated into the machine. Over here is the coolant reservoir. Over here is a small radiator with a fan blowing through it when the machine's on, and it comes pre-filled with coolant. I was perhaps a little overly impressed by this because my personal laser, this huge cabinet laser from Ohmtec, didn't come with integrated liquid cooling despite having all the room in the world for it, and in fact only came with some tubing and an aquarium pump. In the instructions it said, get a bucket, fill it with distilled water, there's your liquid cooling. I was a little bit insulted by that. If you're not familiar with the advantages of a CO2 laser over a diode laser, let's go over them real quick. First of all, there's power. Most diode lasers operate at 5 or 10 watts. The most powerful diode laser in existence right now is at 40 watts. These are 50 watts each. They can easily cut through quarter inch thick plywood and quarter inch thick acrylic. Speed. A really fast diode laser can move its laser head back and forth at 10,000 millimeters per minute. These operate so much faster they use a different unit, millimeters per second, and these can engrave it up to, it's either 450 or 500 millimeters per second. Safety is the big one. These are enclosed units. They've got a built-in exhaust fan at the back, and because they're enclosed, there's no chance of accidentally looking at the laser beam without your safety glasses on. If you open this lid, it will stop engraving. If you open this door, it will stop engraving. These are dramatically safer than diode lasers. Diode lasers work on a visible wavelength of light. These don't, so they can interact with materials that diode lasers simply can't, like glass. You can directly etch glass with a CO2 laser, and you can also directly cut out clear acrylic. Really, a CO2 laser only has two downsides. One is price, even though it's very obvious to see where that money's going, these are triple the price of an expensive top tier diode laser, and the other is laser tube lifespan. The laser in these machines is generated by a large water-cooled glass tube in the back of the machine, and Gwaki and Ontech say that the lifespan of this laser is about 10,000 hours, and a new tube is $290 for this one. If life of the laser tube is something that concerns you, you should know that Gwyneth also sells another version of this machine with, instead of a water-cooled glass laser tube, it has an air-cooled RF metal tube. In case it wasn't exceedingly obvious, both of these lasers are nearly identical. Gwyneth builds the laser, Ohmtec changes a few things, and then rebrands it as Ohmtec. Gwyneth is a Chinese company, Ohmtec is an American company, but obviously both of these lasers are designed and built in China. Ohmtec's basically just a glorified reseller. As of right now, on Amazon you can buy the Gwyneth here for $3,150, and the Ohmtec is listed for $2,900 on Ohmtec's website, and I believe both of them are free shipping. And although they're nearly identical, they're not totally identical, here's the differences. White, black, half circle, half hexagon. Light bar, no light bar. Horizontal, vertical, big danger, less danger. Key, emergency stop button, safety interlock loop thing, and a knob that says beam attenuator, but I have no idea what it does. Gwyneth doesn't have either one of those things, but it does have coolant stains on the label. Obviously, none of those things make any real difference, but there are operational differences between these two machines. The smallest example of which is when you open the lid on the Ohmtec, the light stays on. For some reason, when you open the lid on Gwyneth, the light goes out. This doesn't make any sense to me, but it is a difference. A bigger difference is on the Ohmtec, when it's done with an operation, it moves the laser head 
back to the home position. With Gwyneth, when it's done with an operation, first it retracts the laser head, which makes no sense. It's never in the way. The shroud is more in the way than the laser head itself. And then it will wait for about 10 seconds for, I don't know, then it moves the laser head back to the home position and rehomes itself. It doesn't automatically lower the laser head back down when you start a job. So you have to refocus it every time. And if you don't refocus it, it's going to be way up out of the way and just ruin your workpiece. Both of these machines have USB, Ethernet, and Wi-Fi. Both of them are Lightburn compatible, but the Gwyke Cloud has a little bit extra. Gwyke Cloud makes their own software called Gwyke Cloud, which is a web-based laser control software specifically for this machine, and it works. I'd love to tell you how, but I could not get this thing to connect to Wi-Fi. First of all, it comes with this instruction sheet of how to connect it to Wi-Fi and get it set up with Gwyke Cloud, and the title of it is Quick Instructions Operating System. The process to connect this machine to Wi-Fi is, in a word, clunky. First you hold down this button for five seconds, then it turns purple. Then you go into your computer and connect to the Wi-Fi that this machine is putting out, which will be called Gwyke or something. Then after it's connected, you go to your browser, enter in the very easy to remember 192.168.20.1 colon 8080, just rolls right off the tongue, at which point you're presented with this very inviting web page. Then you enter in the name of the Wi-Fi network you want this machine to connect to, manually. You would expect since it has Wi-Fi, it would scan local available Wi-Fi networks and then populate a drop-down list of Wi-Fi networks for you to pick from. But no, you got to enter in the name of the account manually. And to make matters even worse, according to the instruction manual here, note there is no space in the Wi-Fi account name. If there is spaces in your Wi-Fi name, please remove the spaces when entering the account. That's just simple white space filtering. You couldn't do that for me? Anyway, once you've entered in the account name, making sure that it's correct and case sensitive, you enter in the password and then you select the region, you hit connect, and what's supposed to happen is it signifies that it's connected successfully by turning this light off. That's the part that never happened for me. I tried about 20 times, if not more. I could not get it to connect to my Wi-Fi network, but maybe it's because I got a space in my Wi-Fi name. I don't know. Given all this information, I think there's only one logical conclusion to draw about this machine. And if you thought that was bad, remember this also has Wi-Fi and Ethernet, but instead of me telling you about it, let's watch OhmTech's own video together. Search for Wi-Fi on the computer. Click okay. on Polar 350, then enter the password 123456ABC. One, Great password. Connect, click on Change Adapter Options. Right little complicated land and select properties okay select tcp ipv4 then click on properties select use the following ip address you want me to change the ip address of my computer subnet mask below then click on okay no after that you can leave the page Obviously, this process is needlessly complicated. It'd be a bit like selling a car and telling your customers that they have to hotwire it every time rather than just fitting it with an ignition and a key. But aside from that, did you notice the problem with this whole process? If you're connected to this machine over Wi-Fi, you're no longer connected to your own network and therefore the internet. To use this over Wi-Fi or Ethernet, you have to ironically be offline. And the camera in the lid only works over USB, so you don't have access to that either. Bottom line, don't think of either one of these machines as having Wi-Fi or Ethernet and you'll be better off. They work brilliantly with Lightburn over USB and you should think of them as having no other forms of connectivity because they basically don't. Now, I'm not saying that you won't have better luck with the Gwyke Cloud. You could buy one of these machines and get the online portion to work flawlessly. I just couldn't do that. And in fact, the parts of the Wi-Fi setup process that I could get to work were incredibly unreliable. Using the OMTEC with Lightburn was mostly flawless, but I did run into an issue a couple of times. Sometimes I would send a job to the laser and the light would turn blue like it had accepted something, but then it would freeze. And I couldn't get it to unfreeze without turning the machine off and then back on again. It didn't happen very often and it was just a little annoyance, but I felt like I should mention it. Gwyneth is a little bit more annoying to use with light burn, but for different reasons. Earlier I mentioned when it's done with the job, it raises the laser head up out of the way and then sits there for like 10 seconds. Well, it's equally slow when you go to focus it. You hit the focus button in light burn 
and then a good five seconds pass before it actually does the focusing maneuver. And remember, as I said earlier, you have to refocus the laser head every time before you start a job. Otherwise, it'll be way up out of the way and way out of focus. So having to do that and wait for five, ten seconds every time before you start a job, that's pretty annoying and that makes this more annoying to use with light burn. Both of these have a camera in the lid so you can see what's on your machine bed to make alignment of what you're about to engrave a lot easier. On Gwyneth, the image of that camera is streamed over Wi-Fi, so if you can get the Wi-Fi to work and if you can get their online software suite to work, you have the image of what's on your machine bed. I already mentioned that the Ohmtech does not stream its image over Wi-Fi, but on both of these, if you use them over USB, there is a separate USB port just for the camera, so if you use these over USB and want the camera, you have to have two USB cables. I should mention, and I don't know how this is possible because these machines are basically identical, the Gwyneth didn't cut as well as the Ohmtech did. With the same material and the same focus height, I had to run this machine more slowly than I did with the Ohmtech to get the same results. Quarter inch thick plywood, on the Ohmtech, I could run it at 25 millimeters per second. On this one, I had to slow it down to 15 and it still didn't make it all the way through. I don't know why that is, but I did notice that on this one, the air assist hose is kinked, so maybe that has something to do with it? Everything I've mentioned so far has just been mild annoyances, but these machines have two big problems that I think are big enough to affect a purchasing decision. Starting with the autofocus. For reference, here's how my Ohmtech cabinet laser handles focus without autofocus. It's a manual focus system. Throw your workpiece in there underneath the laser head, and then raise or lower the machine bed until the distance from the workpiece to the laser head is the same distance as the width of this piece of acrylic they provide as reference with the machine. And then it's focused. Now, with the Gwyneth Polar Duo, take your workpiece, measure the thickness of your workpiece. I'm going to use one of the provided samples, which is conveniently labeled three millimeters. Then go into light burn, go to edit, machine settings, wait for it to load. Scroll down to where it says focus distance. For the focus distance, you take 17 millimeters minus the thickness of your workpiece, which in this case is three millimeters, and that's the number you enter into this box. So in this case, 14 millimeters. Hit OK. Now over here is a menu that is not on by default, so we'll go into Window, we'll turn on Move. Now we can see it, go over here, hit Focus, make sure that the laser is focused, which I can't do because I've left the cover on like an idiot. Looks like it's focused. And now we're ready to go. If you'll allow me to be dramatic for a second, can you believe they made it this stupid? Don't make me do math. Just let me enter in the thickness of the material, which they can't do because they're not making the software. Lightburn makes the software. And that's not autofocus, that's manual, and it requires more work than the manual focus on my cabinet laser. Now that procedure isn't so bad with the Ohmtech Polar, but remember with this idiot, it retracts the laser head every time it's done running an operation, so you have to refocus it every time before you hit start, which you will forget and you will ruin a workpiece. And that little formula, 17 millimeters minus the thickness of your workpiece in millimeters, that's referencing off the machine bed. What do you do if the machine bed's not in place? Say you have an oversized item or you're using one of the rotary axes? I don't know. Now just to reiterate what I said at the beginning, I do recommend these machines. I think they're fantastic. They just have a couple of really annoying features. And if I were to buy one of these, the first thing I would do was that little stepper motor that controls the height of the laser head. I'd rip that sucker off of there, replace it with a knob, make my own acrylic spacer key and never look back. Big issue number two. These machines have something in common with my big cabinet laser. They both have, well, all three of them have, Ruida control boards. On my cabinet laser, I've got this control panel here with a bunch of buttons that I admittedly rarely use and a screen that can tell me error messages and general information about the machine and the cut job. The Dynamic Duo here has a button and a light that changes colors. Obviously, they went with this design because they're copying the aesthetic of the Glowforge, which just has a button with a ring light around it. Glowforge can get away with that because a Glowforge laser isn't compatible with third-party software like Lightburn. They use their own software. It's all cloud-based. It's all a tightly, vertically integrated ecosystem. These don't have that. So if you get an error message, all you have is a red light. There is no way to pull error messages off the machine to tell what the problem is. You could be anything from a dead coolant pump to one of these doors slightly lifted up or anything in between. You have no way of knowing. That's enough dramatic whinging. Let's talk about something positive. Both of these machines come with two rotary axes. The reason they come with two is a little bit silly. Rather than making these rollers adjustable in their width, they just made two completely separate rotary axes at two different fixed widths. That's costing you more in manufacturing, right? Right? Anyway, each one of these 
has adjustable width via this simple slide mechanism, and it's got a little scissor lift mechanism on one end to adjust for conically shaped objects. To use the rotary axis, take out the drawer, remove the honeycomb work bed, and you'll see a nice big opening in the base plate of the machine. The rotary axis fits into this nice base plate in the front left corner, just like that. The cable plugs into this port back here, and you activate the rotary by turning on this switch. On the Gwaiki, there's two switches here, I'm not sure why. Now, the laser won't operate without a bed in place because this limit switch is tripped, so they've added this little piece of aluminum here. You push that back and slide this piece over so that limit switch is no longer tripped. Now, I don't love that using the rotary axis requires you to disable a safety feature and operate the machine without this drawer in place, but like a lot of things on this machine, it's just kind of a half-baked feature, and it makes you stand back and think, couldn't you have figured out a way to do that better? And like I said earlier, I don't know how to set the focus when using the rotary axis. That stupid formula that they have to use is referencing the machine bed, so without the machine bed in place, what do you do? For a workpiece larger than the machine bed, my cabinet laser has this door in the front that flips down so you can stick a piece out the front of the machine. These two also have a pass-through slot in the back. This is it. It's got this little piece of rubber acting as the door. It's not the full width of the machine bed. It's only a quarter inch tall, and it's at the back of the machine. Why did they make this so needlessly inconvenient? If someone needs a pass-through on this machine, they're not going to go to the back. They're just going to take this drawer out and operate it like this. Now, I should note that a Glowforge Pro also has an equally useless pass-through slot, but at least it's on the front of the machine, and it's the full width of the machine bed. And I should also mention that a Glowforge Pro, the only one with a pass-through slot, is $7,000. As I've been saying, if you're in the market for a desktop CO2 laser and don't have Glowforge money, or you don't want to Glowforge because you don't want to be trapped in their ecosystem or whatever reason, these are worth considering. But would I buy one? No, Turkey agrees. No, I wouldn't. And there are exactly two things that would have to change with these lasers to make me want to buy one. One is the autofocus. Make it better, or just remove that stepper motor entirely and call it manual focus with a knob and a little acrylic spacer. And two, it needs an error readout. Put a screen in here, a control panel, something, maybe even a console log and light burn of some sort, some way to see error messages on this machine because it can turn into a real nightmare if you don't know what the problem is. If I had to pick between these two, I'd go with the Omtech Polar. It's slightly cheaper right now, and it doesn't do the annoying things that the Gwyneth does, like retract the laser head every time it's done and take 10 seconds for no reason every time it's done. It just operates a little bit more smoothly. But if I had to pick between any CO2 laser, what would I go with? My 60 watt Ohmtech cabinet laser. This has manual focus that makes sense and I've had no problems with. It's got a control panel with error readout that I've had no problems with. I haven't had any issues with this machine other than the laser tube dying early. But obviously I can't recommend this over the Ohmtech Polar. Not because it's more expensive, these are actually exactly the same price right now, but because this is huge! It takes up way more space! The Polar can sit on a tabletop, this takes up a corner of a room. Overall, these are solid machines, and lasers are very powerful tools. I use mine all the time to cut prototypes out of quarter-inch thick plywood before cutting the real thing out of metal. I have no idea what you have in store for your laser. Maybe you want to cut things out of acrylic, make artwork, maybe you want to make prototypes like I do. I don't know but these will do it. Yes, there are a lot of half-baked features. There's a lot of things on these lasers that will annoy you, but the base machine is solid, and I still don't think you would regret purchasing one of them. So that's these two lasers. Compared to a Glowforge Pro, they're half-priced, but also a bit half-baked. You would have a significantly more seamless, much easier to use time if you went for a Glowforge, but is that worth the extra two, three, four thousand dollars to you? That's for you to decide. If it were up to me, I would have, well, I could have both of these for the price of a Glowforge Pro, but I wouldn't get a Glowforge, I'd get one of these. But right now, I gotta buy a new laser tube for my big idiot here. Probably invest in a chiller this time so it lasts more than a year. Stupid, useful tool.